West Coast of America. This rainforest of coniferous trees stretches 1,000 miles from Puget Sound along the Canadian coast to Alaska. Within the forest, red and white cedars furnished the Indians with unlimited material for their immense houses and great canoes, for carved masks and totem poles utensils and boxes. The Indians of this northwest coast developed woodworking to a degree unequaled among Aboriginal people. To fell these huge cedars, they used fire and primitive tools. <laughs> An entire log might be used to make a canoe or totem pole, or slabs might be split off for making planks for houses or boxes. A tapered cut is the first step in splitting out a plank. This cross cut is made with a modern chisel driven with an ancient stone maul. In former times, an elkhorn chisel would have been used. Wooden wedges are driven into the cut with the grain of the log. To split off a large, even slab of wood, the wedges must be accurately placed and carefully driven. Each wedge is tapped in succession. This creates an equal pressure beneath the slab to split it off evenly. <laughs> As the split widens, the wedges are driven in along the length of the slab until it is free of the log. From this rough slab of red cedar, a watertight box will be made. The art of wood carving is highly regarded by the Indians of the Northwest Coast. A good carver enjoys greater prestige than those working in any other occupation. Of the great carvers, only a few are left. One of these is Mungo Martin, Nakapankum, a high-ranking chief of the Kwakiutl now in his 80s. 
present-day carvers use modern steel blades set in old-style handles. The elbow adds, straight and curved knives, short and long-handled chisels, similar to these ancient stone-bladed ones. Mungo fashioned these tools after ancient forms. Simple, aboriginal tools of wood, stone, shell, and antler. His workbench is a flattened log. From any suitable slab, a flat plank has to be split off. This is done in a manner similar to that used to split the slab from the log. Several small wedges are used. One is merely started in on the side opposite a tiny marker. The next is placed close to the first. The others follow across the width of the slab. Each wedge is gently tapped in succession. As the wedges are driven in along the length of the slab, the plank splits free. The green plank must be cut to size and its surfaces smoothed with an adze. Small wedges driven into the workbench with a hand maul keep the plank from slipping. Again used for splitting, the small wedges trim off the naturally tapered sides to square them up. He is planning an ordinary gearbox. It will be made entirely of wood. No nails, screws, or glue will help to hold it together. This one plank, without cutting, will form the four sides. completes the dressing, making the board quite smooth. the long-handled chisel is kept razor sharp. With skill, it produces a very smooth surface. In order to make the board straight and flat, he sights down its length. Any unevenness is trimmed off. Mungo uses the curved knife in both directions. Sometimes the strokes are toward himself, 
at other times away. One end of the board must be cut straight and notched to a depth of one half its thickness. The board will eventually be bent so that the other end fits tightly into this notch to form the fourth corner. To form a watertight joint later on, this notch must be cut with great precision. Caution and minute care result in fine craftsmanship. Mungo's attention to detail, his patience in measuring and rechecking, he believes, are essential to success in woodworking. If this joint were not shaped and pre-cut accurately, it would not fit at the crucial time, just after the other three corners have been bent. Careful attention, cautious trimming, finally brings the cut for the joint to the correct depth. A final check confirms this. Using the splinter to measure, Mungo must lay out three curves. These V-shaped grooves make it possible to bend the board to form three corners of the box. The three curves will be made on the inside surface of the board. the depth and angle of each cut must be carefully predetermined. To do this, a gauge is cut and used for marking. The depth of each is marked on the edge. Laying out these curves determines the overall length of the board and the portion to be cut off. This cutting is done with a straight knife. Each corner must be a right angle to make the box a perfect rectangle. When the corners are folded, the edges of each V must fit tightly together without binding. Therefore, the kerfs are cut to a precise depth and their sides made flat and even.
One of the most useful tools is the depth gauge, a tiny splinter of wood. A shallow straight cut is made on the outside, opposite each kerf. This reduces the fibers to a thickness which will bend without breaking. It is cut to one quarter the thickness of the board. Since the kerf has already removed one half the thickness, and this straight cut is one quarter deep, the fibers of only one quarter of the board remain for bending. These unbroken fibers function like a piano hinge running the full width of the bend. The board is now ready for steaming and bending. A steaming pit was dug in the floor. Carefully planned, it is always as wide as the box will be high and about a span in depth. The length varies. If all three kerfs are to be steamed at one time, the length is about one half the total length of the board. If each kerf is to be steamed separately, a small pit such as this is used. To steam the board for a large box, three pits would be dug, each to fit under one of the kerfs. The steam is produced by stone boiling. Placed in the water, the hot stones cause it to boil rapidly and steam for a long period. To help retain the moisture and preserve the heat, each kerf is covered with shredded cedar bark dipped in hot water. Old pliable matting was customarily used. This larger matting helped keep the entire board warm and moist. Turning the board permits the steam to permeate the cuts on both sides of the same joint. The long wood fibers at each kerf are being softened and made flexible for bending. The steaming is carefully watched. When all three joints are uniformly softened, the board will be ready for bending. Each joint is bent with the utmost care. If any joint breaks, all the work is lost. This requires skill and restraint. Too much flexing will break the fibers at the corners. Any final trimming of the kerfs must be quickly done before the wood cools. 
The four sides are bent to form the rectangle. To hold this shape, Mungo binds the four sides together with a long ribbon of shredded cedar bark. The unfinished box is then put aside to cool before being reinforced with wooden pegs. Work on the bottom and on the lid begins. A board is split from another slab for the bottom of the box. Mungo uses the crooked knife to trim and even up the bottom board. The bottom must be made to fit accurately since no screws, nails or glue are used. Held only with wooden pegs, a carefully fitted bottom will form a watertight joint. The shavings are taken off until the bottom fits tightly. In addition to the outer binding and its wedges, a temporary brace was inserted from one corner to another to keep the box rigid and square. When the bottom is properly fitted, Mungo drills the holes for the wooden pegs. Pegs of the harder white cedar, whittled as smooth as dowels, are fashioned to fit the holes. With a box of this size, ten pegs are enough to secure the bottom and make the box watertight. The crooked knife shears off the pegs to make them flush with the surface. The fourth corner is pegged together in a manner similar to that used for the bottom. In ancient times, Joints were almost always fastened with pegs. In modern times, the Northwest Coast Indians preferred to sew these joints together with spruce or cedar withes. To make these withes pliable, they were twisted, and to prevent rotting, they were soaked for four days in urine.
The joints of the other three corners need no pegs because of the hinge-like bend of the wood fibers. With all the pegs in place, any rough edges are trimmed and smoothed. The marks left by his native tools give the surface character. The groove of the knife, the gouge of the adze or the chisel lend a special style and texture to the beautiful woodwork of the northwest coast. A cover will complete the box. Turning the box upside down and placing it on the cover slab permits Mungo to mark the cover exactly. He will hollow out the area within these lines. First, he makes a marginal cut with a straight knife. Following with a crooked knife, carves out its center. The long-handled chisel again smooths the inside surface of the cover. The cover is always tied onto the box. Mungo drills matching holes through each side. Two cords are braided to be used as loops. The cords are threaded through the holes in the sides of the box and tied securely. The long tie cord is fastened to one of the loops. By passing the tie cord twice over the top, the cover is firmly secured and a convenient handle for carrying is provided. This plain storage box might serve a variety of uses. It could be used for food, tools, clothing, or special gear. Other boxes were made for more specific uses. This special box was constructed to fit into the prow of a canoe for carrying the gear of a hunter or fisherman, or the tools of a carver. Many boxes are ornately carved and decorated. These were used to store dance paraphernalia and other ceremonial objects. These are often painted and some are inlaid with seal teeth or the operculums of certain gastropods and in rare cases with haliotis shell. The very tiny teeth set in the mouth of this carved figure are those of the stingray. Elaborate boxes such as these were highly prized. They were used as treasure at potlatches and other ceremonies. Boxes were used in a multitude of ways, for gathering, storing and cooking in the everyday preparation of food, for drums during ceremonies, for urinals and for bathing. When death came, the body was placed in a mortuary box and put on top of a funerary pole or sometimes in a niche in the pole or into the high branches of a tree of the great rainforest. <laughs> Let's go.